All right, Philippians 4, 6 to 7, and we'll get you sitting down in a second. Let's put it up on the screen. We're going to read it together. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9 is actually what we're going to read, not 4, 6 to 7. We're going to read 4 through 9. And today, I'm going to just give you the framework for a series that I believe we're going to end my time with you here until I go away in the summer, the next three sessions I have with you. And today, I'm going to be speaking about the anxiety antidote. The anxiety antidote. How many people know anxiety is something that we all deal with? Okay. All right. Some of you are anxious right now. How long is this going to go? You may not be anxious about many things, but you get anxious about my preaching. Come on. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 is a verse that we, we know, right? Be anxious for nothing. But how many times something that's so familiar we just kind of just speed through? We get that way even with relationships with your spouse. Come on, your spouse, you can be so familiar with your spouse that you forget sometimes what drew you into that wonderful person in the first place. And if we can just take a moment to go verse by verse in this passage, I believe we can extrapolate something special that God has in there. Because a lot of times when we're anxious, we just throw the scripture at the anxiety and we think, okay, be anxious for nothing. And then all of a sudden the scripture is going to do the work. But if we read this together, what we'll find out is that what God expects from us is prayer. What God expects from us is to trust Him. And what God expects from us is to change our vision off of what's making us anxious and to put it on something else that is holy and pure and to put into action what this Word says. So we're going to read it together because I believe the public reading of the Word of God is so important for the church. And let's read it off the screen together. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, that's where we usually end. That's where we usually end when we read this scripture. But if you look at the NIV, the passage, the totality of the thought that Paul is writing happens between verse 4 and verse 9. And the action of which God wants us to do, which will bring the antidote to the anxiety, comes through this. Uh, now, verse 7, we're going to start in ver uh, verse 8. It says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things and I want to just throw that out there that it's not just enough to 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 pray but that we're supposed to change the target of our thoughts that we're supposed to take our eyes off of what's making us anxious and the Bible says in Hebrews it says fix your eyes on Jesus and then it says this whatever you have learned say it with me whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. It's not just enough to hear the word, but you've got to put it into practice and do the word. For in James it says, just don't be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Are you ready to take the journey with me, Bellrose? Let's pray. Father, give me the mind and the heart of Christ to preach this word without any interruption. I know, Lord, I'm only going to be able to give an introduction today because the hour is drawing near. But Lord, I pray that whatever is said today will be exactly what you want to speak into the hearts of your people. And that, Father, there would be a blessing over their lives as they leave this place, that they would leave in peace and prosperity. And that, Lord, you give me the mind and the heart of Christ to preach this word without any interruption. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. What I plan to do over the next few weeks is to exegete this scripture. Uh, one of the things that is in my heart is, is to not only feed you fish, but to teach you how to catch them. And it's one thing to listen to a sermon, but it's another thing to extrapolate and to, and to draw out of the Word of God everything that He has. And one of, one of the dangers that we have with things that are so familiar is that we glance over them so quickly. Remember, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I preached about the 23rd Psalm and how sometimes we... We read it so quickly that we forget that some of the richest answers in all of Scripture are right there in that passage. And this is another passage that we use along with, with uh, Matthew chapter 6, don't worry, 
because it doesn't add any other days to your life. And we see in Philippians, uh, be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and petition. Make your request known to God. How many times have you read that when you're anxious? How many times have you quoted that scripture when you were going through a hard time? How many times have you prayed that scripture and, and you just, you go through it. And then when you're reading it in your devotions, you're like, yeah, I know that scripture. And you read it and you glance over it. But, but what things you need to understand is that some of the things that have become so familiar to us as believers, when we rush through them, we miss the power of the word. And what I plan to do over the next couple of times that I have with you is to take from chapter 4, verse 4 to chapter 4, verse 9, and exegete or to take out of that scripture everything that God wants to say to us in that passage. Now, we're going to talk today about anxiety. And here's the disclaimer. If you have clinically diagnosed anxiety and depression, if you have been diagnosed by a medical professional or psychological professional with clinical anxiety, let me say this. Take your medications and allow the medical technology to minister to you so that you can have an opportunity then for the Holy Spirit to come in and bless your life. I, I remember what Bishop Jake said, and this is for everybody, just this is a disclaimer because I don't want you to think that I'm being naive to think that all anxiety can just be cured with one thing. I think some of some people get so anxious that they need the help of medication to stop the waves. But Bishop Jakes was talking about the disciples in the boat with Jesus. And that the waves were coming in the boat. And how many people know anxiety allows you to take water in? And how many people know you can only take such, so much water in until you start to sink? Does anybody know what that sinking feeling feels like? Where you just get so distraught over something and it just feels like the waves are crashing. And they're just not moving your boat but you're taking in water and you start to sink. And how many people know that's a hopeless situation? Have you ever been on a raft in somebody's pool and you've exceeded the weight limit and that you all of a sudden you hear the air come out and you start to sink and you realize you're in the deep end now? You know you can swim, but there's something demoralizing about sinking. But when Jesus got up and the disciples asked him to get up because they were afraid of the water coming in the boat and the waves and the wind that was raging, I love what Bishop Jake says. When Jesus got up, he did not rebuke the waves. Because the waves were caused by something else. The waves were caused by the wind. You don't have waves if you don't have wind. It's one of the biggest contributors to waves and currents in our oceans. And so when Jesus got up, he rebuked the wind, not the waves. And I believe that, that the medication that we can take, that if you are diagnosed by a medical professional, can calm the waves so that Jesus can get into your heart and speak to the wind. And I believe that even if you're not on medication and you're dealing with anxiety, anxiety is a, is a symptom of a greater problem. And that many times you are dealing with anxiety because instead of dealing with the root of the issue, you are only dealing with the wave of the issue. And today I want to say, I want to, say to the wind, be still. Because I believe anxiety has busted you and me up far too long. How many, time, how many people will believe that in this season it's time to get rid of anxiety once and for all? <clears throat> now, one of the things you need to understand about Paul is that Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church, but he's writing it from prison. And, and in, in, in the latter verses, after verse 9, he says, I know what it is to be content in all things. I know what it is to be poor. I know what it is to be rich. I know what it is to be all these things. I've been on the extremes. And Paul is saying to them, be anxious for nothing. And let the peace of God, which pass all understanding, guard your heart in Christ Jesus. How many people you love when somebody gives you a theory, but they've never lived it? You're going through something, and all of a sudden, somebody's giving you some, some prescription that they heard on Dr. Oz. I'm trying to lose weight. Oh, well, maybe you should just eat pomegranates for seven weeks and just do a cleanse. And meanwhile, this person looked like they've been at Chick-fil-A a little bit too many times. <laughs> and they're telling you about a diet, but they look like, you understand what I'm saying? How many people love to get advice from somebody who gives you a theory, but they've never lived it? And that's what a lot of people do with Scripture. They throw a Scripture at a problem, 
but they haven't lived through how, There's authenticity when you've lived through something and you've seen God. And when Paul writes, be anxious for nothing, he's writing because he's been flogged in prison. He's writing this because he was, he was a Roman citizen and his rights were violated by the Roman government. He knows what it's like to be minimized. He knows what it's like to be ostracized. He knows what it's like to be in prison for something that wasn't an imprisonable offense. He knows what it's like to sit in prison for a long time and yet not have a trial and not have any, any justice brought to his cause. He knows what it's like to be put away and rot, and yet he's saying, I know what it's like to be persecuted. I know what it's like to be beat down. I know what it's like to be rejected, but I'm telling you, I found the secret to be content in all things. And I'm telling you, you can be anxious for nothing because the Lord is near. You can be anxious for nothing. What he's telling them is not something that was unattainable. And yet how many times have you read that verse and you're going through the trial of your life. You're in a living hell right now. You're in this emotional upheaval and you read this verse. And as much as you know it to be true, you still feel like it's unattainable, like it can't be attained. What if I were to tell you today that it can be? It can be because Paul exemplifies to us that it was. And how many people know it wasn't Paul that was able to live out his life. It was Christ in him, the hope of glory. And I'm telling you, anxiety has an antidote. And his name is Jesus. So let's get into this. Are you ready to dig deep? Now, if I mention the word exegesis, that should mean to you that you should get your notebooks out. Because we're going to school the next couple of days. Friends, I ain't interested in entertaining you anymore. I want to teach you how to fish. I want you to walk in victory. Because I guarantee you, you'll praise a lot better if you could walk in victory. So I gave you the disclaimer that uh, anxiety is nothing to joke about. But when you look at the Mayo Clinic's definition of anxiety, let me give you the, 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 the the terms that the medical community gives us. It's an intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. It's fast heart rate, it's rapid breathing, it's sweating and feeling tired may occur. Now how many people know you may have some of those or all of those or none of those but you still are anxious? You're anxious about something. Common causes of this symptom of anxiety can be normal in stressful situations such as public speaking and taking a test. Anyone ever been anxious because you had to do something? Okay, apparently none of you have ever gone to school. How many people remember back in school when they did shirts and skins, at least the guys? There was that awkward time when you had to take off. They don't do that in in school anymore, praise God for that. But that used to just make me anxious. It still would, by the way, today. But listen to this now. This is the most important thing I want you to get. Anxiety is only an indicator of an underlying disease when feelings become excessive, all-consuming, and interfere with daily living. So anxiety is just a symptom. But it's a symptom that shows that there's something at the root of you that needs to be fixed. And maybe one of the reasons you've had such frustration when it comes to dealing with your anxieties is because you've been yelling at the waves when you really needed Jesus to rebuke the wind. Every one of us have a past, and you are the totality or the sum total of your life experiences. How your parents treated you, how your your relationship with your wife has been, how your relationship with your children has been, and everything you are. And some of your anxieties go back to the five-year-old you. Some of your anxieties go back to the newly married you. Some of your anxieties go back to the teenage you. That you remember, I have anxieties when I walk into a room full of people I don't know. Because I remember what it was like to move from Queens to Long Island in the middle of the third grade. My first day of school was a field trip to the Vanderbilt Planetarium, of which I had to sit with my teacher, Mrs. Topol, by myself because I didn't have any friends. And every time I walk into a new room full of ministers or a group of people I don't know, it's amazing how my anxiety kicks in and I go back to that third grader that moved in the middle, I'm 43 years old, but yet I'm an eight-year-old kid who moved from Queens, from the hood, middle village. (laughs) That's how we roll, Queens Center Mall, come on now. Woodhaven Boulevard, yeah. Left Rack City, all right, anyway, we're going to (laughs) stop. Oh, yeah, 
I'm gangster. <laughs> that kid that moved from Queens to Smithtown, and my first year of school in Smithtown, halfway through the year, it's amazing how the five-year-old me manifests anxiety in the 43-year-old me when I'm thrust into a new situation. You see, your anxiety is, is a symptom of something else deep down inside that may not be right. It may be from your past. It may be from your present. It, it may be from something that somebody's done to you. But the Greek word that's used in the Bible for anxiety, we looked at the medical terminology, but the Greek word that's used for anxiety in the Bible, uh, to be anxious over something, to be anxious about, or to be distracted. How many times have you allowed a circumstance or a situation or a season in your life to distract you? Right? In fact, how many times have you sat in church distracted? Or how many times have you been praying and been distracted? Come on, you start about praying about something, and all of a sudden you get distracted, and you go down the rabbit trail, and instead of praying about your situation, you're praying for somebody to die of hemorrhoids. I don't know, I'm just being very vocal about my prayer life right now, and don't worry, no one in this room I prayed that prayer over. And somebody's like, what's happening to me? Just kidding. But we know what it's like to be distracted. Have you ever been with somebody and not been present? I've been with my wife sometimes, and I've, I've been dealing, you know, like, like there's been things that have happened in my ministry. There's been things that have happened in the church. There's been times where I've been distracted by church things, and my wife and I have been on a date night, and then all of a sudden, something catches my mind, and she's talking to me, and as she's talking to me, she may might as well sound like the teacher from Charlie Brown. And I'm going down a rabbit trail. Of, of the day I had in the office and the complaint call that came in or the, the issue with the building and I'm, I'm starting to get anxious because my anxiety is taking me out of the moment with somebody and it's putting me in another dimension where I'm not present in reality but now I'm in an alternate reality where I'm going down rabbit trails because your anxiety will bring you places you never intend to go, keep you longer than you intend to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. And everybody knows what that feels like. And so I want to mention to you that right out of the gate, if being anxious is an indicator of an underlying issue and that it can be all-consuming, it can be distracting and thus rob you of the knowledge of the reality of that who you are as a child of God because at its core, anxiety just doesn't rob you from people or rob you from the moment. It robs you of, of, of your ability to not only understand but apply and stand on his word. It robs you of the knowledge of who he is and who you are because when we're anxious, we're not thinking that we're a child of God. We're thinking that God has left us. When we're anxious, we're not thinking about that God is the creator of the universe. We're thinking about that person that we deal with at work that we don't want to see tomorrow because when we walk into the very office that we want to have peace in, we have anxiety. And so we take our eyes off of Jesus and we put our eyes on someone or something else because we're distracted. And so what we need to understand is that anxiety at its core is not just a symptom that something else is wrong, but anxiety at its core is a sin. It is a sin. Author John Piper said this in an interview. He said, so yes, worry and anxiety is a sin. And God wants us to trust his sovereign, all-wise, all-good, all-providing, all-protecting, ever-assisting care. This is a trust issue. You see, why is anxiety a sin? Because it's a trust issue. You take your trust off of who God is and his word, and you put it in someone or something else, and you take matters into your own hands. So, so by, by the virtue of you checking out with God and, and fixating on a situation, what you're doing is you're saying to God, I don't trust that you have an answer for this. I've sat in church my whole life, but this cancer, I... and how many people know? If the cancer kills you, it doesn't kill you because you get the ultimate healing and you get to be with Jesus. You see, another reason why anxiety works and it distracts you is because you've been limited to think that this world is everything. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, the calendar is going to win on you. Now look at somebody else and say, you're not going to live forever. Now look at somebody else and say, today might be the day. No, don't do that. <laughs> this is the deal. You're all going to die, unless the rapture comes. And how many people are praying for the rapture? Amen. Come on. Amen. And by the way, 
this, this scripture talks about the rapture. And we're going to get there. We're going to have some eschatology in this house. That's right. Oh, yeah. We're, oh, we're getting theological on you now. Yeah, that's right. You guys have dealt with this far too long. It's time to up the ante. It's time to start to get you to think. Like, whoa, you're going to be wearing monocles next week. You're going to be so smart. <laughs> really? But the reality is, why is, why is anxiety a sin? Because it's a trust issue. And Piper goes on to say this. It says, and he wants us to do it so deeply. He's talking about trust. He wants us to do it so deeply that death itself is not the ultimate threat. That death cannot separate us from the love of God or rob us of our joy. So the godly opposite of anxiety is peace. That would be a good thing to write down. The godly opposite of anxiety is peace. And contentment rooted in trust in God's promises. Once again, I'll say that again if you want to write it down. So the godly opposite of anxiety is peace and contentment rooted in trust in God's promises. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, once again, another verse that we know so much that we skim through it, it says this. Let's put it up on the screen. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So, so we need to understand God desires us to trust him. But trust leads to the direction of our path. And one of the things that gets people most anxious is a fear of not knowing what's next. I don't know what my future holds. I don't know what God has in store for my children. Come on, some of you, you got young kids and you're wondering, what are they going to become? You know, you saw how they handled the knife the other day and you're wondering, are they going to be an axe murderer? I don't know. <laughs> but the reality is we fear the future. Because we can't see into the future. Come on, how many people you know it's going to end for your life? How many people know the next 10 years of your life are going to go? We hope we know how it's going to go, but the reality is none of us know how it's going to go. And so we fear and we get anxious. We get anxious when we go to the doctor and we have a hope and a desire to go someplace, to do something, to, to be somebody. And then all of a sudden the report at the doctor's office doesn't match the reality uh, or the manifestation of God's dream in our life. And then we start to get anxious that what we're hoping for may not even happen. Have you ever been anxious that what you're hoping for may not even happen? Some of you want to get married, and you hear me talk about the rapture. And you're like, God, please let me get married before the rapture. At least let me get a week of my honeymoon in before the rapture. I remember when I was a teenager, because back in the 80s, all the youth pastors used to watch, make you watch Left Behind, you know what I mean? And the Antichrist, and remember, come on, the, the people in the Unite uniforms, you know what I mean? And the whole world was going to be taken over, and the UN was evil, and, and all of a sudden, the, the church was gone. And, and I used to go to those youth rallies where they used to make us watch the Left Behind video, and uh, well, no, what was it? A Thief in the Night, it wasn't Left Behind. A Thief in the Night, that's even more gangster than the Kirk Cameron thing. Thief in the Night give you nightmares. And, and I used to pray at the altars when the youth pastors would have the altar calls. Lord, I'm, I just want to be married and, and, and have a family and do what married men do <laughs> before you rapture the church. And I used to have real anxiety over that. And some of you are single and you have an anxiety because you don't want your future to be cut short. Well, forget about the rapture. Maybe you're anxious that what you're hoping for is not what you're going to get. And you get anxious. See, anxiety hits us in all different forms, and so we know that anxiety is a sin, but here is the kicker. And, and I'm speaking to you not as someone who has mastered this, because if you know me really well, you know that I am a perpetual neurotic. That if I shake somebody's hand who does this, all of a sudden I got the flu, man. It's just horrible. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at everything, man. I had to follow somebody in the buffet the other day. They're licking their fingers. I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fasting today. It's good. I'm anxious about a lot of things. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a Mets fan. Anxiety follows me. But this is what anxiety really is. It's not only a sin. So you got to understand what you're dealing with if you want to be able to see the solution. It's an indication that what you are worried about, and listen to this now, has become an idol. Anxiety is idolatry. And that's hard. That's hard for me to accept in my own life. Someone or something has taken the place of God. You see, it's meaning that you have taken your attention off of God and his word and thus disbelieved him and his word. And that's rough. So I'll just say it right now. All of us, not just some of us, all of us are guilty of sin and idolatry because we have allowed anxiety to rule in our lives. But isn't 
Isn't it amazing to know that even though we are guilty of sin and idolatry, God's grace is never ending. His mercies are new every morning. And that God is not just looking to say, how could you do this to me? No, God is looking to extend a hand to you, Peter, and pull you up out of the waves. And to put you back on the boat. And to fix you up. And to make sure that this thing, God's desire is not just to, to forgive you. And not just to wash over you. But to heal you once and for all. Because it is possible that you can be anxious for nothing. Stop believing the lie of the enemy that it's impossible. All things are possible for them who believe. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Paul said this vocally in verse 10, 11, and 12. I have found the secret of what it is to be content. And then he says this in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when we look at that verse, I can do all things, a lot of times we think of personal achievement. I can start a business because Christ strengthens me. I can be the president of the United States because Christ strengthens me. I could be a player on the New York Mets. I can, I can accomplish great things in my career because of Christ who gives me strength. And all of that is true. But if you look at it in context to what Paul is speaking about, it's an end note and a cap onto his section about anxiety, which means I can get through cancer and still not be anxious. I could lose my family member and still not be anxious. I could deal with a marriage issue and I could still be anxious, which points me back to the 23rd Psalm, even though I I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil because you are with me. It is possible to be able to not be anxious because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Because more so what Paul is talking about is not personal accomplishment, but about the ability to walk through storms and not let it affect you. That's why he says the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I want you to look at Romans 125. Let's get back to that thought that anxiety is idolatry. It's idolatry because we trade the truth of God for a lie. How many times have you felt a pain in your body, gone on WebMD, and all of a sudden you found out by looking at your research that you thought you had a tumor? You went to the doctor and he told you you just pulled a muscle. <laughs> Has anybody who looked on WebMD self-diagnosed themselves to their death whether you started to go to Costco to buy your casket? Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've ever been on WebMD and you misdiagnosed yourself. Come on. You're all lying. This whole section over here, you, you're guilty by the look on your face. That's right. I see it. Tumor over there. <laughs> torn meniscus over there. I see this. You needed a lobotomy. You, yeah, you were signing up for it right now. Right, the whole thing. It's amazing how anxiety can distract us from the truth of God, and we believe the, ang the anxious thought rather than God's word. And we've all been there. Sometimes it's just in the fear of missing out. You get anxious because you feel like you're not going to get what you think you need. And so you take matters into your own hands. And Romans 125 says this, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. When we trade... The peace of God for created things, when we swap out God for anything else, it's an idol. And in Exodus 23 and 4, let's put it up on the screen so you can read it. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Do you realize that God is jealous for you, not just for your love and affection and your worship, but God wants you to run to him no matter what the situation is. See, I don't know about you, but when my kids find themselves in a problem, uh, Dominic is 16, Luke is 12, Rebecca's going to be 8 on the 15th of July. Can you believe my daughter's going to be 8? She's killing me. She wants to get her ears pierced. I don't know if I'm ready for this. She's, she's walking, to, she's trying on bathing suits the other day. I was like, why can't we go Muslim on this? Why can't you just burka this whole thing? You know what I mean? Why can't we just go head to toe where all we just see is your eyes? I mean, come on. Save yourself for your husband at 75. Let's go. 
a burkini, right? Is that what it is? A burkini. Yeah. If anybody, I'll give her, I'll give you her sizes if you want to hook me up with a couple of like a dozen burkinis. Let's get it covered up for the summer. She's eight, but I don't, you know, I don't trust any guy, especially those weird eight-year-old kids. <laughs> she got an invitation to some boy's birthday party over the summer. Ripped it up before she could even see it. You don't need to go there. <laughs> you don't need that. Boys are bad. Who cares if Mateo's turning eight? If he wants to make nine, you better not be there. Anyway. So anyway, when your kids get themselves into trouble and they, instead of coming to you, they try and take matters into their own hands. Number one, maybe because they don't um, want to upset you. And then when you come to them and you ask, how come you didn't come to me? Well, I didn't want to get you mad. But now they made you even more mad because they've made matters worse. I feel like God says to us a lot of times, you know, like, how come you didn't come to me? And that's what anxiety does. It keeps you from going to God. And it, it, that's why he says you need to pray. Because you can't give up that connection between you and God. The other thing that I think our kids do is they think we don't know. I'll never forget when I was a kid, I thought my father was like really unrelatable to me at times. And so like I wouldn't go to him for a lot of things. But what I found out was when I actually sat and talked to him, he was more relatable and more current to my life than I could have ever imagined. Some of the most powerful talks of my life when, when I found out that my father went through some of the very same things I was going through. But he grew up in the 60s, and I grew up in the 80s and early 90s. And so how could somebody from the 60s who, you know, my father detested the Beatles and he loved Chubby Checker. But anyway, that was another story. But how can somebody from the 60s relate to somebody from the 90s? It's like my, friend, my kids. How many, how many adults understand this? When you drive your car, you got control of the radio. You know what I'm saying? I, I want to listen to what I want to listen to. I'll put on the 80s station every once in a while. I'll put on the smooth jazz. I put on Wynton Marsalis the other day, live from Lincoln Center, the Lincoln Center jazz thing. And, and I'm listening to this, and they're all starting to make fun of me. All Dad does is listen to jazz. I was like, because that's real music. <laughs> and by the way, ain't nothing that will help your aggressive driving like a good Van Halen tune every once in a while. Come on now. I, I played Van Halen. My kids must have thought I was the devil. Dad, you listen to this? I was like, yeah, I was listening to this when I was dating your mom. Rachel thought I was the devil because in the, in the, uh, don't, don't trip. God's not done with me yet, you know. But, you know, in the, in the, in the era of, uh, of being able to download music, you could only download the good songs. So you don't have to download the bad songs on the album, right? I don't know if maybe God's still in this deal with me. But we were in the Valley Forge Library studying for a theology exam, and I had Van Halen in my headphones, and my wife thought I must have been the Antichrist. But my kids look at me and they think because I listen to old people music. Van Halen is old people music. That like I don't know who Bruno Mars is. You know, and like I shocked my son. He's like, Dad, you don't know one song from, I, I, you don't know one song from Bruno Mars. 24 karat magic in the air. I don't know Bruno Mars. Hashtag Jesus, hashtag blessed, you know. <laughs> I'm a dangerous man with some money in my pocket. Get up! <laughs> and they're all looking at me like, you know Bruno Mars? And, and, and so I, I say all this to divulge that I'm pretty much insane to tell you this, that sometimes our kids think we can't relate. And it isn't amazing how sometimes when we go through anxiety, we don't think God can relate. We think that it's an ancient, he's an ancient God and we got a current problem, but... Ecclesiastes says this, that there's nothing new under the sun. When he says he's your shepherd, that means he's your shepherd for everything that you need. That there's nothing outside of your life that God can't handle, and there's nothing outside of your life that God can't relate to, because the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4 that the high priest that we can go to has been tempted and tested in every way, but yet was without sin. I'm telling you, Jesus understands everything that you are going through right now. Never fall for the lie of the enemy that this word is outdated. This word is right on time. This word is alive. This word is more current than current is. This word is an answer. This word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And never underestimate the power of prayer because the Bible says that God knows what you need even before you ask it. So I'm telling you, he already knows what you're anxious about. He already knows the cause of the issue. He already knows the wind that's making the waves. Never discount what God can do in prayer. And he says this, be anxious for nothing but with everything by prayer. That means you need to have a prayer life. 
and petition, make your request known to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And some of our mouths speak stupidity because we've allowed our heart to be marred with insecurities and anxieties. So, Have you ever been surprised with what came out of your mouth? It's because, because you've not allowed the Lord to guard your heart. But then it says this in the latter portions of the verse. It says it's, it's not enough to pray. you got to change your focus. It says whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is holy, right? Whatever is, all these things. He says, he says think upon these things. And that, that reminds me of Hebrews chapter 12. It says, it says this. It says throwing off the sin that so easily entangles, we fix our eyes on Jesus. And one of the problems why you have not been able to get past the anxiety of your life is because you pray and you give it to God and you come to a church service, but yet you still continue to look at the issue. And whatever you look at over Jesus is an idol. And Paul says this, it's not enough to just pray. You've got to look at things that are holy and pure. You've got to change. So if you have a problem looking at women, if you've got a problem looking at men, you know, all the commercials where the women look at men is usually with a construction worker like this. <laughs> shirt off. If I did that right now, I look like, the, I look like uh, Slimer from, you know, like or the blob. <laughs> <laughs> Look like Jello Jigglers. <laughs> you got a problem looking at men. You got a problem looking at women. If you got a problem lusting, if you got a problem with pornography, if you got a problem with gossip, if you got a problem with 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 getting back at somebody, if you got a problem with anything, you can't just pray it away, and you can't just read the Bible over it. You've got to make a choice to fix your eyes on Jesus rather than the issue. And the reason why you still have anxiety, it's like you're praying about it, but you're still looking at it. You're giving it to God, but you're still, you're still looking at it. And whatever you look at, as a man thinks, so he is. And what you allow to come into your eyes goes directly into your heart. That's why it says, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind. But your heart and mind can't be guarded when you still choose to look and, and it may not even be a physical picture. It could be an emotional feeling. You're looking on the emotional feeling, but you need to look at God. You've got to trade what you've been looking at for something that's better. And then the last thing he says is do these things. So I want you to stand with me. Verily, why don't you come in and sing this last song for the last time in the second service ever. Until we trade for you for a player to be named later. In a blockbuster deal, signing the most exclusive free agent in the world, <laughs> Verily's Jordan. I'm going to ask Verilis to sing a song, but I want us to do something before we sing that song. I want to see, see, I know this is, this is like, this is foundational because I'm going to really get into it when I come back from Los Angeles with you. How many people are excited for that? Amen. Amen. But... I know I told you, like, all right, so here I am. I'm leaving you off. I'll be in the office the whole week. I leave on Saturday to go to Los Angeles. But here I am. And by the way, pray for me because, you know, I saw San Andreas. I don't need any more earthquakes, all right? <laughs> the rock ain't going to come save me. But what I'm saying is this is that, uh, you know, I, I kind of left you hanging here today. I kind of left you with, like, yeah, um, anxieties, idolatry, and a sin. See you guys later. I'm going to Los Angeles. But what I want to show you is this, is that scripture is enough to actually slay the demons in your life. So many times we think we need another sermon, we need another gimmick, but all you need is the word of God because the word of God is alive and active. And so what I want to do in this situation is this, I want to look at the scripture on the screen again. I want you to look at the New Living Translation. And what I want you to do is something very similar to what we did with uh, the 23rd Psalm. We're going to take it verse by verse and I want, I want you to... Uh, let it just minister to your soul. So let's let's put it up on the screen. The first verse, verse 4 in the NLT. Let's look at it together. Philippians 4, 4 in the NLT. Let's look at it together. We can just get it up on that screen in the New Living Translation. Okay, ready? Let's, let's say it together and then let's pause and let's look at what 
I want you to look at what you can take away from this verse that you can apply to your life this week. So ready? Let's say it together. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Come on, would you just pray that and, and meditate on that? Father, just allow me to be full of joy in the Lord. That The joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'll rejoice because I know that you're on the throne. You'll never leave me or forsake me. I want you to pick one thing out of that scripture, out of that passage that you can apply to your life this week. I choose to be full of joy. Let's look at verse 5. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. How many people know the other passage says the Lord is near, Jesus is coming soon? How many people know no matter what, Jesus is on his way, he's Lord, he's on the throne. Come on, give him some praise. What does it say? Let everyone see that you're considerate. You know what that means? While you're anxious, don't take it out on everybody else. Lord, I'm going to be considerate. I'm going to trust you. Let's go to the next one. Don't worry about anything. Let's say it again. Don't worry about anything. What does that mean? Let's say it again. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Let's say it again. Instead, pray about everything. One more time. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Come on, take a picture of that with your heart. Pray about everything. Lord, the minute I get anxious, I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to you about everything because you're relevant in my life. There's nothing that you can't speak into. And I'm going to thank you for what you've done. Let's look at verse 7. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. How many people, you would just say, Father, I need your peace. I need you to exceed anything I can understand and guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Let that verse minister to you. Let the word of God be enough right now. Let's look at verse 8. Here's the action step now. Remember to pray, and then verse 8 and 9 tells us what to do. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Just, just say this right now. Lord, change my thought pattern. Oh, Lord, let me focus on you. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is all of those things. Now, verse 9. Keep putting into practice all you learn. Let's say that again. Keep putting into practice all you learn. What are you going to do about what you heard in today's sermon? Keep putting into practice all you learn and receive from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Come on, let's give the Lord the praise that he deserves now. Let's let the word minister to our heart. And let's sing this song together. Come on, for victory. I am who you say. Come on, come on, let it slay your anxiety.
anxiety does not have to be part of your vocabulary anymore. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through things, but Paul said this. I just want to read it to you because you need to hear this. He said this in the latter verses in verse 11 through 13. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whether the, circum whether the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We do not have to be plagued with anxiety anymore. We can be free. We can be free. But we need to be prayer warriors that talk to God in prayer that realize He is relevant to everything we're going through. The second thing we need to do is we need to fix our eyes on what is perfect, and that's Jesus. You can't continue in your anxiety if you're looking at someone who is more powerful and greater, because then that song becomes a reality. Then you know who you are, and you know who he is. And if I know who he is, I know my father can take care of any demon that's in my way. And then the last thing is this. You just can't be a hearer of a word. You got to be a doer of a word. That means you need to put it into practice. And the last thing I know about practice is that in practice, it's okay to make mistakes. But in practice, it's not good to not do what you've learned. Take what God has put in your spirit today and walk it out this week. Because when you start to walk it out this week, that's when the word starts to come alive. And I want you to remember, the, the reason we read that scripture at the end is because the word is enough to slay every demon in your life. You don't need the word in a sermon. Sometimes you just need the word. And let that word penetrate your heart. Let that word absorb into your insecurities and your fears. And remember that you're more than a conqueror. I'll be here this week. I'll be celebrating uh, kids' summer camp. But how many people, you will pray for me that as I go to Los Angeles for traveling mercy, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and that when I come back and speak to you on the 21st, we're going to take this to the next level. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Remember who you are.